This is for anybody that does African American research. They should, you know, they're welcome to come to these types of things. So we're going to start really with, uh, and again, I'm going I'm to ask questions a lot of times as a former teacher, but uh, I don't know how many people, and I figure if you've been doing genealogy for any length of time, you know this person, right? You know Wilma Gibbs. Actually, I knew her as Wilma Gibbs um, for the time. Uh, I think one time when I came there, and all of a sudden she was Wilma Gibbs more, and I didn't, I didn't even know that. Um, but Wilma was really, really a, a, a person that was very impactful to, to uh, the African-American genealogy and in this space. Um, so she spent 30 years at the Indiana Historical Society library as a senior archivist uh, in the African-American history program. Uh, she served as the editor of the Indiana Historical Society's Black History News and Note publication from 1986 to 2007. How many people were getting that? Anybody just getting the Black um, uh, History News and Notes? Okay, yes, it was, it was a nice publication. And that's how we kind of interacted is that I'd come down for different events or whatever, and I'd come, I'd roll over to Indiana every so often, and then she would try to get me to write something because I was really doing a lot of work on coal mining and that kind of stuff. So she was trying to get me to, to write some articles and to do some things. And, and she actually, she was, I was so busy. I said, I'm always doing something, which is a good thing, but uh, I, I we never really connected. And it had been another maybe decade or more. So and then I was here again, I met her. She was so gracious. We talked about it again. And I was getting ready to actually write some stuff for her and collaborate with her. And within about several months or so, uh, 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 she was gone. Uh, but she really was very, very impactful. So things you see, anything you see that has her name on it or or something like this, the Black uh, History News and Notes publication, that's a, that's, that's a very good, good publication. And so what you want to do is you want to get your hands on that and, and, and look at maybe there's an index out there or something like that. It may be... In my mind, and we're gonna, I think we're gonna have a slide that, that, that addresses this topic, but uh, a subject, but it may be in Percy. I'm, in my mind, it would be something that would be in Percy. You guys know what I'm talking about? I say Percy, the uh, periodical source index from the Allen County Library, they'll have it in there. So if, you, if you're looking for it, you can search the Percy index and stuff that you put in there is African American related, particularly if it's Indiana. It's probably gonna come up and there, probably, there might be stuff from from the uh, the news and, and notes publication that she had done, but uh, she's just a she was just a trailblazer, and uh, we're uh, I'm, I'm dedicating this particular uh, uh, day to her. Okay, so at the core of African American research, okay, uh, in my opinion, my humble opinion, there are some resources that should be near the top of the list for those doing African American research. The landscape is really kind of messed up now with. The good and bad for, for internet, right? It's got lots of pluses, but then it's got lots of minuses because it gets muddled. You kind of trying to figure out what's really true. Anybody can hang their shingle out there, right? Whether they're barely competent, you know, or whatever. And so you just don't know what you're going to get out there. So it, make, it muddies it a little bit more, especially for people that are starting out and don't really know where should I begin and that kind of stuff. And this is a beginning thing, but it's a problem for everybody, whether you're a beginner or somebody else the stuff that's out there in the way it's being kind of fed to you uh, these days. But again, in my opinion, I've been around a long time. The things I'm going to talk about in this session, I would pin them, you know, like you could pin stuff to the top of your Facebook page or whatever it is, so it stays up there. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about essential uh, uh, resources. These are the kind of things that you should not ignore. If they're not making any sense to you now, or you're like, oh, I don't have any military people or whatever. If you research long enough, you're going to have some military people, right? Your family just keeps growing and growing and growing. So you want to keep these things close by because we are all kind of, in a sense, uh, uh, jacks of all trades and master of none type of thing. So we want to accumulate as many expert guys that we can have so that when that area comes up, well, we don't really know how to fix that sink. You know, we have a, a something there that'll help us get through that process. And so this is where everybody should start. This is where everybody should start. You should, everything really starts with your public library. It does. And I heard, and again, all libraries aren't created equal. Just like everybody out here is created equal, right? But these libraries, some of them you go to, like mine in Wilmington, oh, we have something called the North Carolina Room. Been around for 30, 40 years or whatever. It's outstanding in what they've collected and what I can go in there and access for North Carolina in the Cape Fear area. I met a young lady here today that says she's the genealogy library. 
So there is a genealogy librarian, so you're very fortunate to have somebody because that's not a guaranteed position, of course, in every library. And so it's nice that you have somebody like that to tap into because um, they know things, right? And, and, and more important than that, it's like uh, Morgan Freeman in that movie uh, uh, when he's in prison, Stop State Redemption, when he says, I can get things. Right? <laughs> he was the guy that could get things. And the library is a place that can get and deliver things that you need, okay? Because every library is not going to be structured for wherever, for African-American genealogy necessarily, if the, if the area is was occupied or came in, was Swedish or whatever, and, 70% of the people are Swedes, then they're going to have that kind of material there and not as much African-American or whatever. But what we're going to be talking about here and what they will be doing there is getting you what you need. They can't necessarily put in the library all the stuff you need if your family's going down to Georgia and then they're in the Caribbean or whatever. They might be able, but they have those resources that they can then point you to and they can help you gather those resources. Guaranteed they can do that for you. And so what I call them really is they're an indispensable partner on your research journey, and you should make them a partner in it. One of the most important contributions is the ability to get us resources via interlibrary loan. And I call that ILL, that's what it's called. I didn't make it up. <laughs> interlibrary ILL is what we say, we throw out there. Now, how many people have used ILL, interlibrary loan? Okay, good. You guys can come out here and say, man, this I'm going to look real smart before this thing is over with because I say I have lots of information. And that's that again, that's a cornerstone thing. That's if, we, if we were taking a test and you were coming to help, if I was helping you or whatever, after a while, I'd be saying, hey, you got to check these boxes or whatever. If you ain't doing interlibrary loan, if you ain't doing this or whatever, I don't know if we, if I can really invest time in helping you because you're not moving forward because you're not really investing in the things that will get you to the successful point you want to be. And so interlibrary loan is really, really key for libraries, especially libraries that, that uh, and most of them are, they, they don't have an uh, infinite amount of resources. So they got to get those things from other places. And so what I call it is the gateway to resource acquisition. That's how you get the books that you need. Uh, it's a way to order books and other items um, related to your research that are not at your local library. Okay, if you were looking at the screen and could see it clearly, you see my, you see my card, my public library card from Messenger Public Library in North Aurora, and that's where I was shoveling snow for 20 some, 30 years, 30 years in that house in North Aurora. Uh, it was a lot of, I keep thinking, I'm thinking, but it was a lot of snow. Um, but that's where I was, and it was a real small place, and there wasn't a whole lot of African Americans in that community, right? Because uh, this is a little tiny town. Aurora, Illinois, most people know Aurora, Illinois. Well, North Aurora is just a little bump just north of it. And so they didn't have a whole lot of anything. And so what I would do, I would go in there and Jesse Alfelder, I, I, we, we, I built a relationship with her. And so we would, she would come in. Uh, I actually started doing genealogy drop-ins with them where I'd come in and uh, people could drop in genealogy and we would help them with their research and that kind of stuff. But you built and you forged those relationships. And so what I have up here on the screen actually is an interlibrary loan uh, request I had put in. And it was for microfilm from the uh, state library. And so they had to fill that request. They sent it. And as soon as it came in, the library sent me an email saying, hi, Tim, your, your, uh, your newspaper microfilm is in. And then I had to do is come to the library, pick it up, and then watch it or, or use it in, in the library. Yeah, that was really the only restriction. And then I had it for probably, I think, three or four weeks. And you can renew and all that kind of stuff. So it's really, really a handy way to look at stuff that you normally wouldn't be able to look at. So, but this is the exciting thing for me. This is one of the areas that I excel in and that I put a lot of energy into. Um, and when I see the word university or college library or college, I'm like, okay, I'm really excited now because uh, that's really, we're going to talk a lot about that maybe in the third session. Um, but what you do at the library, of course, what you have to do is you have to get a library card, that local library card. Again, that's, what the, that's the key, getting a local library card. And many times, and again, every state is a little different, whatever, Ohio is much different than Illinois, but you get that library card, local library card, and, and at times, that places, it'll allow you to get a university card. Some universities or some state university systems or whatever will allow you to get a university card. And if you can get the university library card, 
do not reject that. Do not say, oh, I don't, I don't want to get it. Especially if it's free, even if it costs a little bit of money, get it. Because I, I McDonald's, right? What do you call it? Supersizing? Supersize me. You get supersized with a card like that because they can do so much more there than what your local library can do. Now, hear me right. I didn't say they can do more, so you have to you can ignore the local library. The library is the gateway to the other one because lots of times what they'll ask you for is your local library card. They want to make sure that you you know you don't have eighty books that you haven't turned in or your account or did they're going to deny you. Right, so they check with the local library first to make sure you're in good standing before they give you anything like that. So you want to try to get seek out a library card. And if you guys make sure you get my email or whatever, and this is, when you when you hit these successes, send me send me something. Say I got the library card. I'm serious. You can send me stuff. I'm busy, but that kind of stuff I answer because I'm really excited for you when you're on that new journey, and it's an exciting journey to be on. Uh, or it will allow you not if, if you can't get that university library, if it doesn't work for you for whatever reasons, then you can get uh, public library cards uh, or public. Or it'll help you get maybe a, a, a library card for another public library. And again, when I talk about these public libraries, some are big, you know, big, little and, you know, small, medium, large, extra large. And so you have these larger libraries and you can get access to them that is great for you, right? Again, you're 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 going outside of your public library walls to get the things you need. So I'm 30 some miles west of Chicago in North Aurora, and boy, I tell you what, that woman was staring at me. I did I did I did a major happy dance. Like the genealogists do this happy dance when they find something really consequential, you know, shake it, shake it, shake it. I was shaking it. <laughs> I was shaking it in the middle of the Chicago Public Library. Because <laughs> I went to the Chicago Public Library and because uh, I had heard a rumor that you could get, if you're an Illinois resident, you can get a, a Chicago Public Library card. Oh my God. You realize how many money they get in their budget to buy stuff? And when I looked there and I salivated all the time about how much stuff they had, because the people in my genealogy side would rub it in. Oh, we got the Chicago Public Library. We got this old shut up. <laughs> I'm at this little North Aurora Library. They talk about what they get in the Chicago Public Library. She said, Some of you, I went to the next meeting. I'm like, I got one too. <laughs> and they gave you access from a remote access to things that I didn't believe you could get remote access to because they had the power because they were big. And so they could really tap into some of these information content providers and get stuff that my library and others couldn't. So the Chicago Defender, which is the paper we're going to be talking about. I had access to that online. It was just, it was heaven on earth. So I, I think I did maybe two or three dances every time I went in there, I think I was shaking. It was just, it was really something. But you can, so I hope you're getting what I'm saying. It's, it's very powerful if you can get something like the Indian, you know, Indianapolis Public Library or whatever, and you can get access like you're actually an Indianapolis uh, resident. And then there's something that I've learned with all my experience is when you go to those library websites, look and see if they have friends in the library, even the local lo your local library. You really should try to become a friend in a library. It's usually a small, it's not really usually very much, $10, $15, maybe $25. But that money goes to help in the library in general. And sometimes it gives you additional benefits that you wouldn't normally get. And that's the enticement to get you to, to do it. They give you some kind of benefits. And so look at that. You're doing a good deed. And then also you may get a benefit in return for doing that. And you want to do that because sometimes you'll really get some really nice stuff. And I'm going to twist this a little bit and say that which if you went, if you're a college person, if you graduated from college, look at the friends of the libraries at the university too, and or the alumni programs and things like that. Because lots of times between the two of them, they might be things. And some, again, it's just, I can't believe it. I'm like, why did I go to school there? Because of the things that they offered versus what Illinois State where I went my, my thing was kind of low in what they were giving people and some of the others were pretty high. So they got to work on their stuff at ISU. That's all I got to say. And so this is a place, again, you can't see here what it's called, Southeastern, uh, um, Southeastern, what is it? Southeastern uh, Baptist Theological Seminary. The read between the leaves there. Um, and Southeastern, well, the place, again, Southeastern is in Wake Forest, and again, I I was going to say I'm an old country boy. I sure ain't no old country boy. I, I was urban boy. I was in, I was not the country. But I was I was but I was limited in what I what my what my knowledge was and stuff. And, and so I I was a basketball fan. I knew I knew what Wake Forest was. I thought I did. 
Because what, but what I knew is I knew Wake Forest because Tim Duncan, I'm talking now, you might know Tim Duncan was a great basketball player and I was watching Tim Duncan back then. And so he played for Wake Forest. And so I knew all the good basketball teams. So but anyway, when I came to North Carolina, where the Wake Forest is, and so when I was like talking about Wake Forest, sometimes people would be like, okay, the city of Wake Forest is not Wake Forest is. There's a whole other place called Wake Forest. This is where this place was. And so again, that, and that's important to always be on the ground. If you're doing genealogy research or whatever, and it's, you got to get out of that chair, you got to get away from this machine, you got to go to and, and learn the lay of the land and know the different nuances that are going on there, like that kind of stuff. Wake Forest is really the Wake Forest. So I was at Wake Forest University, which I wanted to be, but then I learned there was another Wake Forest. And that's where Southeastern happened to be. Southeastern I was doing, uh, I put together a presentation. I spoke, I speak at national conferences quite a bit, well, not as much anymore. Um, but they, I was putting together a religious uh, talk, you know, amen, you know, uh, African American genealogy research. And so I was trying to find, I was researching and finding material so I can put together an hour presentation, 50 minute presentation. And so some of the stuff I started doing interlibrary loan was to places like this. Now, you don't have to know where they are to find it. But again, I didn't pay this much attention in college. I only got straight A's. <laughs> I did not get straight A's, let me tell you right now. But I really did focus in when it came to genealogy on just not just asking why and poking here and prodding there and opening this up or do and doing whatever. And so when you put an interlibrary loan request in here at the library here, they're not, you know, they're not going to say, well, where do you want to get it from or whatever. They, they put it into the system. And they got this thing. But I look out there. This is what I did. So I knew I wanted it. I knew it was a unique item. Right. And so and I knew I wanted it because it was going to be really good for my presentation. And so this is what you can see now. This is my I sent them a letter. I sent them an email saying, hey, I'm letting you know something's coming. <laughs> it's coming and it's coming soon. And this is what I want. But I was able to, if you're experienced researchers, you know what I'm talking about. Something might look real good in the title, but you don't know exactly what it is. But if they own it or their libraries or what it's just, they will help you. That's usually what they're, they, they usually like doing that. And so I wanted to let them know, hey, if you want to help me, it's cool with me. And so I let them know what I was looking for specifically and saying, hey, this is what I think is in here. And if you know that it's not, you can cancel this or whatever. But I built that relationship with them. So I sent them the thing. They sent it back. They sent me some other additional information. I told them I was doing work on this thing. Um, I told them where it was coming from and asked them some questions. Any insight you can provide is appreciated was the last thing I put on that email. And so, and so again, I really encourage you to do that type of thing. I wasn't interfering with the interlibrary loan process at all. I knew there were only a few places that had that. And I knew I had a relationship with this was a college library that I said is there. I said, you know, and they said that they would loan it to us because it's not a guarantee they're going to loan anything to you, too. And so, again, so you want to be an advocate for yourself and help the system. You don't want to you don't want to be in the way uh, and overstep your bounds. But you want to you want to try to I want to so I want to do whatever I needed to do to help me get that. OK, here's a book, one of a couple books of the. Because I, that was my problem. I had so much stuff I wanted to put in here because I'm a bookseller too, African American stuff. And so I got so many things I could recommend or think. But again, we're talking about the stuff that gets pinned, right? The stuff that we pin up there because it's really important. And so this is a book I stumbled across because I was looking for stuff and saying, what is the best stuff out there for African Americans doing research? Because the biggest problem, the biggest challenge for us is what slavery. Our people are enslaved. 1870? <laughs> Find them there. After that, unless they're free people of color, right? we lose them. We lose them. And so we all didn't want to, I mean, I'm pulling my hair. Obviously, I, I, that's why I'm looking. You're trying to find these people and you get gray and you just look. It's just really. And so this book is outstanding because it's just what I need on my bookshelf or in my local library or someplace I can get it for the interlibrary loan to keep it as long as I can. Right. But keep looking for it. And hopefully getting a copy of my own. It's called a Dictionary of Afro-American Slavery. I think it's an indispensable reference guide for navigating the complexities of slavery. Okay. The first thing here, first of all, it breaks down the particular institution. It breaks down slavery by state. 
And again, when I was growing up, okay, make sure I stay When I was growing up, it, it, it was a babe in doing research, right? My people were from Virginia. They weren't from the deep south. They weren't from the deep cotton picking south. But everybody, when they talk, even the teachers and whatever, when they're talking black history or whatever, and of course, you know, African Americans are almost tied to cotton. They pick cotton. So everybody thinks that they picked that cotton in the South, that's everybody did it. But they put just tobacco, right? I mean, indigo and rice and South depends on where you are, what they were doing. And so that was the education that I needed slowly. I'm like, okay, they were in Virginia, so most likely they weren't doing no cotton, they were doing no cotton. Uh, and so you have to figure out well, what were they doing then? So you have to do that kind of research when you're researching your people. You just can't research them individually. You got to research what they're doing because that'll dictate then what records you might want to go to and look at and stuff. And so I love this book because I could go to Virginia, comma, slavery in and see what that what slavery was like local, right? In that state and dig down versus some of else. And that's critical. That's really, really important. And so I love that about the book. And then it had like the entries were accompanied by this select bibliography. Again, which you, you gotta love bibliography. If you don't, you're in the wrong business, you're in the wrong room because that's what you want. It, it gives you those nuggets and things for you then to go and find another book and another book and drive these people crazy because they're like, oh, oh didn't we see her yesterday? You know, get back up in here because you're finding so much stuff, right? It's terrific. And so this book, again, Here's eight things that they have that I just pulled out of there. It's stuff to think about. Urban slavery, different than rural, you know, and you might have an ancestor that's urban and rural. Once you do your homework and figure it out, they may be, they may be rural, but then they may get, I'm going across here now, hired out. There, that was a system that was pretty much in place all over the South for a pretty good period of time where they would hire your ancestors out for a period of time, around the end of the year, Christmas time, January. And so my people might, they were close, they were in Atlanta County, close up to Richmond. They may get hired out in Richmond and that type of thing. So you gotta educate, you gotta know this stuff. And when, and when you're in something in, a, in a, a session or whatever, and you learn a little piece of something about it, like, then you, that's when you grab this book and pull out, oh, I never heard about hiring out. This, this one we're talking about hiring out. Then you go get yourself educated. This book is outstanding with that. So it talks about slaveholders, small slaveholders, because again, we always learn they were on the big plantation, you know, big, you know, big, the big house. And then the facts are most of them were not on a major plantation. They were on smaller plantations, right? 25, 20, 25 people or less. And so they weren't. So that's a different way that they do things than a huge plantation. And the books that they keep and the way they keep them and all that kind of stuff, what you may find in a archive or whatever is different. Uh, Manumission is they talk about overseers or about the overseer. You know, what is that really? What do they do? What kind of people are they? Whatever. Slave songs. What were they singing? What were they doing? Uh, that type of stuff. Elderly slaves. Again, yeah, when they get a certain age, that was one of the problems, right? If you're going to run away or something, you want to leave, leaving the ones that really couldn't go. Right. And so that's a totally different situation. So you want to hear, learn about them and what was going on with them and that type of stuff. And then the prices of slaves. Again, you see that sometimes, depending on if you look into certain records, what's going on with the, with the slave prices and why is this price here on here? Why, how do they arrive at this amount or whatever? And so, again, you get educated on the prices of the slaves. There's a book that was out um, and I can't think of the name. because I got too much stuff crammed in my head now, but it's, but it's called, for, I think, for their, for their pound of flesh. I think something like that is the, is the title of it. It's a female, uh, and it's an excellent book, but it's all about for their power in the flesh. She wrote a book, a, a university professor, specifically on that, the, the whole process of, of, of uh, slaves and what they were worth and how that was calculated and all that kind of stuff. Um, very, very good book. And the internet's so great now, you put in a couple of different words and it'll probably pop it up. And if I think of her first or last name, sometimes you're going to happen, maybe two hours later, I'll say, oh, her name is whatever. Uh, okay, well, I talk about university libraries because that's one talk that I put together. One of my favorite talks is talking about university libraries. And so I pull some stuff from that topic uh, to share with you today. But when I talk about that topic uh, and I set it up, what I do is I talk about this. I talk about the, accept, the access and delivery of university content because it changes. I say, if some of you all got there, if you went to, you know, oh, I went to, you know, Tuskegee or I went to, uh, uh, 
North Carolina State or wherever you went and you graduated, if that was 30 years ago, child, you got an education when you go on campus because it's just not the same. It is totally different. And I got news for you if you graduated five years ago. It's different. They're just always changing and they're really changing a lot in the last, as technology, technology is dictating that. So they're trying to get more efficient. They're trying to, they're trying to please some of you got grandchildren, that younger generation that's a little different. You know, you walk into there now, you're like, hey, what the, they have to sleep in here or whatever. These big lounge chairs, these big old, you know, rolling, we used to have beanbag type things. They got these real, I mean, they just encourage them just to lay on down, take a nap over here or whatever. I'm like, what did they get in your work? Why are you in the library? But it looks totally different, I'm telling you. It's really different. But the way they 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 deliver services is different too. And so that's what we're going to talk about. But we're not going to talk about all of that because we don't have time today. But I wanted to share with you one of the things, of course, the way they, they deliver services, you can access services is going on campus, right? That's that's the major way, that's the conventional way of doing it. Now with the internet. Library websites are big. And now they're pumping more money into library websites because they know they have to give not only their students, but other people to the general public, and they're competing against other ones. So, they, so the advent of something they call live guides, live guides or live guides, library guides is what they are. So you can go online in most places, especially the big, big schools, uh, but the smaller ones too. And you'll have these library guides that they put together and you can go and find out a lot about what their collection is in the area of history, African-American history. Then you'll have a librarian that's in charge of that. So you can then actually email her and ask her questions about African-American and African-American collection, that kind of stuff. So that's that's that changing landscape. So you can get a lot out of a, a library website, not as much as if you go, but whenever I go, that's how I prep to go. So I know what I need to know. I know the questions I need to ask. And if this person that I'm talking to doesn't know about those resources, I can refer them back and say, oh, you know, that's where I got it. It's off of your website. Again, an educated person, boy, boy, you got a power. You will power that way. And you don't walk away with without stuff that you should have. Uh, and then, but the big one we're going to talk about today, as far as this presentation, essential, is this is what really, again, I'm the king of happy dads. Let me just admit. Because when I find different things, it just gets you so excited it, because it's something that I've been doing it so long. I was part of that evolution. I was going to the library and having to operate in a certain way. And then they started operating in a different way to my advantage. And it was one of the things was this scholarly material on the Internet, stuff that was normally I had to go and walk down in the library to access. Well, now I can access it just out on the Internet for me to grab you know, government document type stuff and all manner of things. That's great. And so these websites you should be familiar with. Um, uh, Happy Trust is what I call it. Somebody call it Hattie Trust. Happy Trust, Internet Archive, and then Google is a major player, but I'm not going to talk about it really much here. But the first two, these are two major repositories of content typically seen in college libraries. So 10 years ago, when I was going to a college library, I, or I was going to a college library to get this stuff. Now I can go to one of these two websites and download, in some cases, especially on Internet Archive, I can download the whole book or the whole document, whatever it is. That's, that's a game changer, right? It's, it's fantastic to be able to do that. So you don't, you're you going to have to at some point go and make a campus visit depending on what you want. But now because of this, you can get a lot of stuff in the library that you couldn't get before. You had to, to, to truck on into the library. And so... so so you spell those oh, the, 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 the first one called Happy Trust, H A T H I, trust. Do you trust me or not? That type of thing. And then Internet Archive is the other one. You, you, you're more than welcome. Okay. And so Happy Trust is a, I'm not an expert, but I know enough about them and their relationship because I interact with them enough and then librarians I do too. They have like collaborative agreements with the libraries kind of, you know, the libraries open up their archives and gives them this older material or this material, whatever it is, and then they take it in and then they present it and they have it there. And so they've got this relationship. And I know it's a unique relationship because they sign agreements and that relationship, when they, when they get that stuff, there's restrictions to it. So the students that are there, the students that have pay intuition and whatever, they have access to have to trust full on. 
because their library gave, gave them stuff, right? Their requirement was to give them stuff and then we'll let your, we'll let your students and faculty access everything that we're getting from University of Missouri, Indiana University, uh, uh, Park University, wherever. And so they have those kind of, so, so it's gonna be tricky for you when you're trying to get stuff because you're not a college student. If you're not, you can't get the same level of access. Um, well, we're gonna talk about that again in a second because I don't see this on this, I don't see it on this slide. Um, Internet Archive is more of a, they just are out there and they're, they're both wonderful. They're out there just amassing content and most of it is just stuff that's, that's out of copyright. And a lot of stuff is out of copyright. I'm just gonna say reconstruction. When did reconstruction happen? Eight, it was 18, uh, 65 to 1877, right? 1865 to 1877. That's a lot of material we'd like to look at. But that's when our people first came out of slavery and we really are interested. That's reconstruction. And so if that stuff's out of copyright, a lot of the stuff I was going looking for in the library now, we can find on Internet Archive for free. Okay. And both of them are, are, are free sites. Again, it's just restrictive with uh, uh, how to trust. And so I got a picture here of, of, of uh, the crisis. And if my mind is working right, the crisis is the one that is the publication of the NAACP or NAACP, right? And so, oh my gosh, the thing that they put in there, the things that you can see, the articles that they write, uh, it's just amazing. If you've never seen uh, the older issues of the crisis, it's, it's really something to see. And those types of things, some of those are on, uh, Internet Archive or on Hathi Trust and Internet Archive, probably. Um, but there's tons of do government documents that we want because we get tunnel vision again, government documents. Oh, it's all about the, the census records and whatever. The only you, can, you can't name but two or three government documents that are federal or whatever because you're that's all you're doing is military records and, and uh, census records or whatever. But there's so much that the government have, and that's the kind of stuff they got tons there. Uh, and then they got historical serials, which is like journals and that type of stuff, publications and, and more stuff out there. Um, this is my tip to you. Make an effort to affiliate with a library that can give you full access to Happy Trust. You know, may not be easy. Uh, if you've got, you got a grandchild or whatever, they've got a password or two. When they come home, better be all over it. Why are you there? Yeah, come on home, child. Go we'll be here for two weeks. Great. Give me that password. You know, but they look like he doing it or she doing it, right? But but that again, your your parents or whatever can get some money, get some out of that money, the tuition they send in there every every you know uh, semester or quarter. So so, but try to do that. That's just an option that I would I would suggest you do. Um, and the Library of Congress is one place. If you ever go up to Library of Congress, yep. Question. So every university has a trust. I would say most of them. I think most, I, I'd say a lot of them do. And what you would do, again, you would you would go to the library website and just go to their databases. And usually they're all in alphabetical order and you'd see if they have. And that would be one, it's, that's the way you would look for that. Internet Archive, you just go on, type Internet Archive and you just access it right there on your on your computer. Yeah. Uh, I say Happy Trust, you actually can too, I'm sorry. Happy Trust, you can do that too, but when I was at Northern Illinois University, they had an agreement where I was able to have a little higher level when put out on a computer that was in their library. So that's what it knew. And so it was treating, treating me as somebody that was in the library. And so I had a little bit higher access there. And that another reason for me to go to the library was for that additional level of, of access there. But when I went to Purdue, <laughs> I couldn't get that access. I was not happy. Sometimes again, you have to learn. Sometimes you say, I done drove all this way. Y'all told me the stuff was here. Now I can't get it. Now you tell me I got to drive all the way back to Lockport. I hear that voice there. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not happy, man. That I'm telling you. <laughs> I said, hey, whatever you can do. He came over to me later and said, give me a list of the stuff you need to download. He said, right, well, I'll download it for you. I gave him my flash drive. All right, brother. Appreciate you. <laughs> but I mean, the stuff you have to do. But he could do stuff that I couldn't do. Um, and so the last thing about Internet Archive, if you use it, support it. Uh, again, it's a way to, I know everybody's on budgets and whatever, but again, you don't have to give them $150. $5 makes a world of difference. Everybody gave $2, $3, $4. It really makes a difference because that guy and what they're doing is really tremendous. And every they only ask like once, maybe a year or twice a year for you to give them 
uh, contributions. Okay, so here we're talking about the, the book that uh, a, a number of you that registered and you're in the first 25, you were able to get this book, uh, Discovering Your African-American Ancestors, one of the most recognizable guys in, guides in library collections. Most times you go places, you'll see this book. Uh, it's just it's staying in the test of time pretty much. Uh, and it's been out there for a long time. Um, this book was the result of a, of a attempt by a genealogy publishing company to bring a series of how-to books. And so I don't remember the name of the other, but you know, discovering your Italian ancestors, I think it was one, right? So they were going by nationalities and whatever. They were creating these how-to books. When you create a how-to book, that's great because, right, the people that do that have that, that mindset. And so it's kind of strategic in the way they, so it's like a book that you can take and use and follow it like a step-by-step. Uh, and you know that they've got this certain structure that they're using. They use the same structure pretty much for the Italian book that they did for this one. Of course, there'd be different records that you look at, but they tried to follow kind of the same flow of how you would research and what records you would need and stuff. So I like it as a teaching book. That's what, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's more of a teaching book. I, there's other books out there, Tony Burroughs' book, but Tony Burroughs was talking about and giving you all the, the knowledge and information about what he did and who he found, right? He found a Pullman Porter and he found a lot of exciting stuff. Tony's got maybe eight pages on the Pullman Porter and his, you know, Uncle Jake or whatever. And actually, it's not bad, but it's not in sync like that. He's, he's got more based on what he found and how his family came out as far as what records they were in and what stuff he was able to find and stuff. So this book is different in that way. So it was published in 2003. They reprinted it in 2008. Uh, Emily Croom, who was the other person uh, with Franklin Carter, uh, she was an accomplished author of genealogy books. That's what she did, which made it a very solid book, uh, too. That's why it's still a great book. Uh, Franklin Carter Smith, very talented African-American researcher. Uh, he, he provided that, that essential perspective and insight to the book, right? Because he was researching his family, and he and he was very good at what he did. And that's why they picked him to do it. And I got to tell you, and I told Franklin this first time I saw I. It was so long. I thought Franklin Carter was dead. <laughs> I never heard even. I go to conferences all the time. I never see. I say, this dude's a rock star. You know, he must be gone. I didn't tell him, ask anybody. Next thing I know, I'm going to a, a genealogy conference or going down in Texas or whatever. Oh, a good friend of mine took over a library in Texas, Houston Public. And she said, oh, Frank is, Frank's one of my uh, librarians. Frank who? Franklin Carter Smith who wrote the book. <laughs> like laughing though, he rolled from the dead. <laughs> but it was really exciting to meet him. He is kind of a recluse. I mean, he just doesn't get out a lot. Uh, he's doing some institutes. He and I are now teaching in a, 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 an institute in Texas. Uh, so I've gotten to know him a lot better. Uh, but oh boy, he's very, actually very, very intelligent. And, and, and I can see that book. He was a lawyer. Uh, he, he was a, a, a trained lawyer. He got his law degree and stuff. So he's, he's a sharp guy. He's a sharp guy. Uh, he just retired too out of the library about. A year or so ago, a year and a half ago. Uh, but this book stands the test of time. Every book doesn't stand the test of time. This one does because it's organized, like I said, in that logical manner, easy to digest, perfect for teaching a class type of thing. You know, this week we're going to cover this, and you can almost like kind of go through the book and do that kind of stuff. You can skip around a little bit if you want, but you can pretty much just go through. Uh, jam packed. This is it's jam packed with great tips. Okay, and when I said great. I wasn't just. That's not hyperbole. It's great tips and strategies are in this book. Some of them very subtle, but impactful. Like some of us, we, again, we don't know what we don't know. That's one of my favorite phrases. We don't know what we don't know. And so you have to research and you're seeing stuff and you analyze the document. Okay, come analyze the document. But if I ain't got the right tools to analyze it, my analysis isn't very good. And so example I put here, and I saw this all the time early, but I was in a genealogy society. So at some point when I'm talking to people and saying, yeah, it's just, you know, and they were like, okay, I'm like, I can't, this, this thing has, I don't know, it's the initials of the guy, the parent or whatever. And he said, let me see that. You know, that DK on there for the parent, they say they don't know. It was the, the, they don't know. But I didn't know this. I was putting on there that they don't know who the parents were and stuff on a death certificate. So again, it's these little things that he'll talk about kind of in passing in the book that educates you really about African-American genealogy in general, but the, the subtleties of, of research in general, what you may find. Uh, but it, it has just numerous high quality case studies. And that's the thing. All these great case studies, but he takes these people in each of these different chapters. And even inside the chapters, he talks about and does a little case study. Let's talk about so-and-so. Then at the very end, he has a, 
uh, three or four case studies at the end. So it's worth it just for that. It's, it's really, it's really, really a very, very good book. And what's interesting about him, about Frank when I talked to him uh, and, and got to know him when he was talking at we were teaching the same institute, some of the stuff he was doing, he's really in the DNA now. And so he continued to research his family and he had lots of new breakthroughs. So it's really cool to see these families that he got to a certain point and he got stuck with in 2003 and 2008 on the edge of technology and the breakthroughs. Ancestry was a little wannabe. I mean, they weren't even all that great back then, but he's now able to use technology and DNA in particular when he was stuck in Roblox, he's busted down those brick walls and moving forward. And he does talks and stuff about the DNA. And it's so neat to see him go back and he's grabbing these people that you kind of know because they were in his book. That's really kind of exciting. Now, here's the book that's like, I call it a nice compliment. It's the perfect compliment to Smith and Cruz's book and to Tony's book too, because Tony's book is old too. I think he knows who Tony Burroughs is. And so this is called The Best of Reclaiming Kin. This book is by Robin Smith. She's a new kid on the block with, when it comes with a, with a book that I, I'm labeling this, I'm calling it an African-American genealogy guide, because that's what it is. She didn't put it out as an African-American genealogy guide, but it fits the bill. Um, and she's just so talented. She's really a seasoned and accomplished researcher. She writes this outstanding blog called Reclaiming Kin. Okay, Reclaiming Kin. You put that into the uh, browser and it, it'll, it'll pop up. Beautiful website, lots of full chock full of lots of information. And it's all 21st century stuff. So you've got somebody that isn't disputing what Franklin did, but she's talking about, I'm going to Ancestry. Versus Franklin saying, I'm going to the National Archive look at a microfilm because there ain't no, there is no internet at that time or there's no internet with uh, those uh, microfilm on it. So we were, we were cranking the microfilm re readers at the National Archives up in Chicago or somewhere. Uh, and so she, then you can, she can make those connections with that. And so uh, in 2015, what she did is she was writing these blogs consistently. So in 2015, she took the best of her insight and scholarship research and put them into print. And that's the best of reclaiming Ken. It is, I don't know how many, just dozens and dozens and dozens of articles, blog posts and stuff. And it's the best of what she's done. So it's really, really very helpful. And it's a really, really good reference book. She ended up doing a second volume a couple of years ago. Uh, and she didn't print that one. This one, you can, you can get a print copy of it. The new one, the second, the second volume, volume two, is in PDF format. So you go to her website and just buy it uh, there and download it there. Uh, but the, the, that website is an essential research treasure. It's a very, very good place. Okay, so now we're moving on to uh, familysearch.org. Again, somebody get confused on my family search. Again, in some circles, I know what that means. Other circles, they may not know what it means. Some people, it, when you say Latter-day Saints, you know, Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints, then you know, oh, those people. You know, Mormons. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that's the people we're talking about. And so they are, you know, a, a, a religious organization that uh, uh, is heavily vested in uh, family history and doing family history research. And they have pretty much the largest collection in the world that I know of. Uh, and it used to be all in, in Salt Lake. And you had to go there and uh, Michael Field could get sent to a, to a library here or to, a, to one of their uh, uh, affiliated places locally. And that's what we would do. We would order microfilm, but they converted and now they do everything. Uh, they don't do microfilm anymore. They, they said, we're going to digitize everything. I'm like, I'll be dead. I'll be dead with Franklin. <laughs> and it was just astonishing how quick. I don't know how, I still don't know how they did it. How quick they turned over and got, I think that they're 100% now. They're very close if they're not. to 100% of all of those millions of reels of microfilm. So is this Ancestry.com? Is it the same as Ancestry? No, this is... This is what you do. You're going to get to, you're going to get, as I get done talking today, you're going to know, you're going to know where to go to learn more about this website and what is, what you're going to do with, with this. Very good question. Ancestry is different. Ancestry, you have to pay. Family searches do not have to pay. They have the census record. They have, they have lots of the records that Ancestry will charge you for. You can get access to them here. For the vital records, all kinds of stuff. And they got lots of help. We're talking about we're going to talk about that now. And they're very, very helpful. And, and there's ways to learn. Actually, everything right in here. Next five minutes, you're going to be educated on that um, as far as what they do. Well, they're a nonprofit, ancestry for profit. They're sort of charging you. you got too much money. They charge you a lot of money for your individual account. Uh, these guys are nonprofit and they're free. And they encourage you to, to come to them. 
Uh, they say discover your family history through records. They again, they have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of records. Again, they've been doing this for a long time, going to different communities and microfilming those records, and they're still doing it today. They're going to all parts of the the country and the world, microfilming records. And so a lot they have stuff that Ancestry does not have. Uh, and so right, they complement each other in a way. You want to look on the other one if you don't see it here. And so this is what this is what I love about them. I mean, I like a lot of things about them, but one is, you know, you can you can find uh, you can get help. You can if they have a local uh, uh, place, local library, you can go there. If the library is an affiliate library, you can go to that affiliate library, which is a public library that has uh, uh, they act like a one of their kind of branch libraries, and so you can get the access there that way. Um, and so they they really do try to help you either in person there, uh, but mostly on this website, this FamilySearch.org website. It's really where they they're able to leverage because they just built it out amazingly, and they have all kinds of stuff. I think I'm going to get to a videos and all that kind of stuff. So I click down at the bottom, and where did I click on? Oh, explore more helpful resources than what I clicked on. And then it's, just, it's got a page of all of these different resources that you can uh, click on. So, you can, I mean, you can spend, you can, you, can, you can take and plan time every week to explore and get to know this website better. I'm going to spend an hour a week or whatever, and it's worth it to do that and learn more about what they have and stuff. And so, but the thing I'm going to talk about, is I can't talk about everything. I'm going to talk quickly about the Family Search Wiki. And that's what I'm pointing to is a wiki on here. And the family search wiki is just like what? When you hear wiki, we think of the what? Anybody? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. And really, it's the wiki part, you know, it's, that, it's the way they branch out uh, and, and people can add their knowledge uh, to that, to the wiki. <clears throat> and so they have a wiki that's all dedicated to genealogy. And so they have this wonderful wiki uh, that's out there for you to explore. And the thing is, you can put stuff out there. If you find something, uh, you can then add that this African American some record or whatever, and they don't have it for your city, your county, your state, or whatever. You can go to that particular part and add that to it, so then everybody else will know it then and stuff. And so again, something that we encourage is that you go out and help them and help your fellow researchers that way. And so I clicked on research research resources, and so here when you click on that, it just gives you all these different resources. Uh, again, to help you, beginning genealogy. Some of us think, oh, well, I've been doing it for a long time, but you might feel like a beginner in certain spaces or whatever. So it'll, it'll orient you to lots of different things, including how family search works and that type of thing. Uh, they have this thing that's coming up. It's coming up very soon, isn't it? Like in, within a week, they have something coming up. I'm clicking on now, it's called a Roots Tech. And don't mean Roots Tech. It sounds like it's technical. Roots Tech is this big party big giant party and lots of the top people and, and experts and there are people you know this too in your community there are people that are experts at certain things they're not speaking on the national stage but they know their business and so they take applications for people to talk on certain topics there's just thousands of topics and so you get people that are very knowledgeable and they all come they all come now virtually and it's in person this year but you can do it virtually or free sign up uh and you can go to roots tech and it's just an amazing experience. It's going to knock your socks off how big and huge it is. And you don't have to wait until Roots Tech this year to do it. You can go and actually see the Roots Techs from last year and the year before and whatever. So everything that was recorded, every person that spoke, they all organized it by topically and whatever. And you can go. So if you're interested in a certain topic, you're working on a certain topic, you can go see, oh, who talked about that? And again, lots of lots of times these people are very, very good, right? Um, like I say, I'm not about to say everybody is at the top, but you you get something out of almost everybody. And so um, you can you can search by speaker, you can do that type of thing. Uh, they just sent me, they just sent me a complimentary pass to Roots Tech 23 online event. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if they sent that to a, another hundred some. 400,000 people I'm trying to make it sound like they're doing me a, you know, your compliment you pass. I know the guy that's the chief, the chief genealogical officer uh, of, of, a, of a family search, uh, David. And he, and so it's like, first thing I looked to see if, it was, if his name was on. 
And his name went out. Okay, they just they just they're being nice and helping me pass. Like they're just making targeting me, making it really nice. But I felt I felt loved. Uh, but you, but you don't have to. You can sign up and you go. But you don't have to. You can see it live. But again, everything that they do in the next four or those four days, you can get it later. Now, this is the place I have to ask because I like I, before you ask a lot of questions. But I have to ask this question. Allen County Public Library. Raise your hand if you've heard about Allen County Public Library. <laughs> okay, yeah, the Fort Wayne. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so moving that at least half of you raise your hand maybe a little bit more because that is just a that again we talk about the, the, the people don't appreciate what's in their own backyard. Well, it's a couple hours away, maybe less. That's true. I used to drive to Illinois. Sometimes I get up early in the morning, drive all the way there, spend all day there. Cheap, didn't want to pay for a hotel. Didn't have a lot of money. I was a teacher. So I didn't have a lot of money to begin with. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pitching my pennies and whatever. And so I spent it all day until they closed. Closed at nine. See y'all. <laughs> all the way back to Illinois. You know, and that's how that's how fantastic this place was. Just absolutely fantastic. Kurt Witcher, who's the manager there, is an outstanding individual. He he's one of those people, again, you talk about, you're like, you look at him, and he's so genuine. I mean, you I can joke, we can joke with him and stuff, and we do you know, and everything. Like, you know, sure you ain't black, Kurt. <laughs> because he has such a passion about collecting African American for for that library. He's always asking me, always after me. You saw any new books, so you did whatever. And it's like genuine. He just wants to make sure everything that he possibly can have and offer the people that walk through those doors, if African American related, that he has purchased it. But they got a big budget. And he spends it. If it's African American, he'll spend money on it stuff. So he's an absolutely amazing guy, and we're very, very fortunate to have him. He's been around for many, many years. Uh, and so this is what the website looks like. I know you guys can't see it very well, so I'll slide through some of these. But this is basically the website, and you go there. What's great about them again? That they're all they do is the genealogy center of Allen County Library. So the, the, the Allen County Library is like a regular library, but then they got that genealogy center upstairs that's just amazing and blow you away. And so, but their online presence is, is great too. So does this library by chance allow people that live in the state to get a card like the ones you have? Their collection is not circulating so that would be yeah. that would be your big advantage is, is that would have been your big advantage but no it's it's what they do is what they do is twofold and, and it goes right into what i'm about to say so what what their big strength is that they have this website they already have the collection that i'm just not going to get there because it's like a kid in the candy store so you can come there but if you can't come there and they really they really uh, took it to a different level when the pandemic happened. And so they really built out their website. So between those two, you really get a whole lot for free. For free. So you don't have to try to get a card or whatever with them. They're absolutely amazing. And so what I'm looking at here is they 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 explore genealogy. They have they said our services tab. So on their our services tab, uh uh oops, okay, yeah, they all service, we're gonna talk about that one. Then they have the genealogy community. And these are different things that they have, their online presence. They have a, a e-letter that goes out called Genealogy Gems you can sign up for. Uh, they're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. And they have this thing called Ask a Genealogy Library. They got experts in DNA. They got, they got experts pretty much in everything because that's what that's the high quality that they have and they maintain there. So use them, again, use them as a vehicle to solve a lot of your problems because they've probably seen or what you have run up against before because that's what they do. Uh, and so, yeah, you, but it's free. That's librarian. And, and they, and I say it's, they, they go above and beyond what a normal librarian would do because that's what they do. That's what she's getting paid to do. That's what he's getting paid to do. Um, and so again, they just have a whole bunch of stuff. I see you guys can go out there and look at it. Just speed around through here. But they talk about who they are. They have a, and this is the thing, it's talking about what they do in educating you guys. So I'm getting a lay of the land now as far as how much experience you guys have uh, researching and whatnot. But I'm pointing right now to visit our videos. And so you can go there. They've got all of these different videos uh, that are all, out, most of them are outstanding. They want, they do in-house are outstanding. Gather home resources, the research process, kind of, you know, Organize yourself to have more success. Um, 
on the Ask Genealogy se section, they actually have consultation. So you can ask them questions, but you can also schedule a one-on-one -on -one with them. Whereas it co might cost you for a, a research, a genealogist to help you is, is you know, $30 an hour or whatever it is, it's all free there and it's high quality. So you can get consultations with them and stuff like that. And then this page is just, this is just tons of videos that they, they recorded over the years and they, then they post them. When they have people like me, Matt, did you see me on Allen County? I did. So he saw me doing the presentation. Boy, I, when Kirk comes calling, I'm like, yeah, it's cost you, man. And I, no matter what the prices I charge him, because he likes my custom made stuff. And I love because all these libraries and what finding stuff he knows, nobody else produces this kind of stuff. So when I come, when I come, when he comes calling to me, he says, do you have time in your schedule to do something? Uh, I say yes, because I know I get more money for what I do with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a bad guy now. Let me make sure I'm keeping this straight. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My mom ain't raised no dummies either. And so when, when I've got a list of talks I can do, you know, the church said amen, whatever. But he asked for custom. You want custom cabinets? Yeah. You, you get your checkbook out, and you're paying more money than if it was the regular ones. And so that's really what the relationship is. Is I, is I get to charge him. So I'm glad when I see him coming. I can invest the time, but then I get to go to libraries and stuff. So it's a win-win situation yeah. for us. But again, there's just tons of videos. They're, they're absolutely wonderful. There's something called WorldCat. I hope you guys have heard about WorldCat. WorldCat is terrific too. But this is your lucky day. I said it's, it's your lucky day because these things are out there available to you. I say, well, as you write these things down, you got to, I don't need to come back in this area for probably two years that I'm done. <laughs> don't, don't call me anymore. Because, really, because you're going to have so much stuff to explore that you ain't going to need me, even though you got my, you can have my email. Um, but really, truly, WorldCat is, is, is amazing. It's on the screen now because, uh, and I sat in this session, and you can go out there now, it's on your YouTube channel. Uh, Aaron Smith did it. He's a, he's a genealogy materials manager there. He did it, him and Cassie, Cassie and Young. They did a great talk on introduction to WorldCat. So again, I don't have to touch it, touch on it, other than touch on it and give you the information. Now you can go to somebody who knows it more than me, better than me, and get really schooled on how amazing WorldCat is. And I now talk about WorldCat again. I think, or maybe the next slide is coming up. So, so briefly, really, WorldCat is the world's largest library catalog. Lots of libraries upload. Lots of libraries, not all libraries, upload their collections. And it's just a massive line. So when you go to your library and, you, and you're looking on their catalog, this thing is, is everyone's a dwarf. Any, any library you can think of is kind of pretty much a dwarf compared to WorldCat because they're taking everybody who wants to upload their material there. So when you put in, you're looking for a book, when you're looking for Robin's Reclaiming Kin because they don't have it here or whatever, it tells you libraries close to you. If you let it know where you are, it'll start giving you taking off libraries based on the geographic one that's five miles away or 15 miles away or whatever. And so you get to see where it is. So if you're taking a trip because you like you go to Chicago to see your sister or whatever, then you get you can plan and see what they have in Chicago and know what's there and whatnot. And not just at the Chicago Public Library, but everything that's in that general area, because WorldCat will spit it out if they're in the system. And lots and lots of libraries are in the system. So here's that National Archives I was talking about. National Archives really, really is. Uh, NARA, as we call it, is the caretaker of military record, which most people do because they're going after pension files, and that's, that's how they know NARA, and then the census record. But caretaker of our military record is so much more beyond the, the other stuff. It's just an amazing site. And so it's just like, it's just NARA.org. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, or gov. Let's see what it is. It might be, might be archives.gov, but we'll find, we'll, but that that is a gateway to a wonderful uh, uh, collection of, of federal dockets. It's uh, <clears throat> www.archives.gov. Archives.gov, yes. And so it's just amazing. And so their first page, again, it's got to cost five different things you can look at or whatever. We're going to drill down to the good stuff. I clicked on the blogs to begin with. They have blogs. They have national blogs. And one of the blogs um, that they have is called um, Pieces of History. And Pieces of History... Uh, uh, what it says, it talks about these different pieces of history. There's so much stuff there. So, their archivists and other people are writing about these different things that are really giving you, introducing you to new stuff that you didn't know was there. You know, as they go back into the archives and the old dusty files and stuff, they find all kinds of stuff. And 
that's where they write the pro the prologue article, something called prologue. But that's a magazine they've been writing for many years. The guy that was the expert, one of the experts in African American there for many years, Reggie Washington. So he retired about five, six, seven years ago. He would write articles and prologues about the Freedmen's Bureau and other things because he was in the touch of those records and he knew that the public didn't know a lot of stuff was going on there. So that's the kind of stuff you'll find there. And then there's another one just called, hey, I wonder what they talk about on this one, Re Rediscovering Black History. It's another blog just completely on that. And so it's going to be dealing with all kinds of stuff African-American uh, that they find just in the, in the archives uh, collection. And we know the, arch the archives says every everything including the stuff that president is supposed to get back. <laughs> a lot of stuff. They do lots. But they, have, they actually have a section called genealogists. So they, they, they have so many genealogists there that they have, when you go down to the bottom of that page, on the left-hand side, you look, they got a tab for genealogists. And that's what I'm at right now, the genealogist page. And again, it's everything you would be thinking about wanting is there. Uh, they have uh, really neat stuff. Two of the things we're going to talk about real quick is something called, um, I didn't even know about this until I started really researching it several years ago. They have something called History Hub. And you can basically ask a bunch of questions there. You can do all kinds of stuff, but it's a history hub. And it really does have a lot of neat information where you can ask questions, do stuff. So check that out when you go there and see what that is. And then the other thing that, that floors me that I think is great is they do genealogy fairs. I highly recommend these are something called genealogy fair. Uh, fairs every year. I believe it's every year. They missed a couple of years, um, but they took it digital after a while. It used to be on site. And I just highly recommend it. Just like with the uh, uh, family search or whoever I was talking about, that once they do stuff, uh, Allen County, once they do it, once they do their genealogy fairs, which invite their expert people, the people in-house are, are doing the fair. It's usually like maybe two, three days or whatever. Then they put them out on their website. So if you missed it real time, you can go and click on a link there for that, and you can actually then go, and I'm on that page now, I know things are difficult to see, but National Archive Genealogy Fair and Series, you can go all the old, most of the old ones, all the way back to when they were actually recording them. I did the very first one. Reggie Washington called me and asked me to do it. And, and, uh, and I'm still friends with most of the people that, that did it that year, but that didn't get recorded. That was, we all came in mid 2000s or somewhere in there to, to do talks and stuff. And so that was when it first started and then it evolved to where they pretty much use most of their own people and that type of thing. And, uh, but it's high quality, really, really is good. Um, so there's just an incredible amount of, of, of untapped material in the National Archives, okay? Um, and much of that is being brought to light by something called history vault, history vault. That's a new term. A lot of people, you know, you guys are looking about some of these other things. Oh, that history vault is, is pretty new on the scene. It's been around, it's been around, it's been around five years or so. That makes it new, okay, in the space. For most people that aren't just wired into genealogy at the at the level where they're doing uh, the national conferences and things. And so what we're going to talk about history ball later uh, in a later session. So JSTOR. JSTOR is, is a, another tool. Again, we're pinning all these up there. Yeah, it's the pathway to that scholarly research I was talking about. Everything's not going to be in Hattie Trust. And it's not going to all be an internet archive and stuff. A lot of the library stuff that they kind of keep to themselves is in JSTOR. They use JSTOR as like their clearinghouse. Like, we got talking about, talking about those lounge shares or whatever. They're trying to free up space in their library. If, if, when they're ordering, they, when they have subscriptions to 125 magazines or journals or whatever, scholarly journals, that's a lot of that's a lot of space that it takes up in a library. So, so JSTOR is this nonprofit. That, that's what they did. They were very smart. They used that digital technology and they just, so they just digitized. They got, they digitized most of that stuff and now they can get those digital contracts. So now they're not getting that anymore in the print format. They can free up that space. And so lots of stuff that you want will not be at lots of libraries in print. It's going to be on JSTOR. Okay. And JSTOR is for joint storage. And so it's a thing you just cannot ignore. You have to, you have to use it. It's short for journal storage. It's a subscription database but they don't charge you money the way I do it. Um, it's, it's found in a number of public libraries, uh, but mostly it's a fixture in the, in the post-secondary libraries. 
okay, the college libraries is where you almost like the, she asked the question, is that you know library? That you're gonna find Jason, it's one of the ones that most of them can afford to have and it's integral, so they they, they have it. Uh, and so, and I say it holds older journals of, of select journals, uh, because again, that's the catch. The, the companies want you to still want the people to pay for, want the institution to pay for their journals, but it's okay, you know, five years out or whatever to start digitizing those and making them available, right? But they, if they're paying for the print subscription or whatever, they don't want it to turn around and be immediately on a site where people can look at it for free uh, without going step into the library. So that's the way they operate. But here's a list of things, again, I know you can't see these. Uh, what I'll end up doing actually probably, and I'm, and I'm okay with that, lots of, lots of research and genealogists aren't okay with it, but I am. Uh, I'll go through this in the next, whenever I can get to it, which will probably be in a few weeks or so, and maybe slowly but surely, but I'll, I'll cherry pick and pull some of these slides that have lots of information on it because I really act them. And I, won't, I don't like sitting out my whole presentation, but like when I talk about this, I want you to see all of these different journals and stuff. So I'll pull certain out. I'll send it to and everybody's on the list. He, he can send. Uh, he can send uh, uh, it out to you, Matt. You can send it out to you. But these are when you do African American. See, you guys, most of you, and I, I ain't saying everybody's not uniform, but most of you, genealogy is genealogy, and you really don't think much about the historical component. But history and genealogy have to stay in balance. They have to. Reconstruction, you have to know reconstruction. The example from that book I was talking about, you have to know slavery in Maryland, whatever. That stuff is written by scholars. That's what they do. And so they're producing this stuff. You have to absorb that stuff. That's why I'm in university libraries so much, because then it opened up the door to resources. I'm like, oh my, I'm looking at the bibliography. Oh, NARA, the National Archives has that, has those, I never knew they had that stuff. Now I can go on their site and find some things to help me solve a mystery or whatever that way and stuff. So these journals are very, very important. And there's lots of them that are African-American related. Uh, and so don't, I'm gonna send you the list so you'll know the key ones, but I put another key one on here too, because you have to get smart. Just because it doesn't say African-American doesn't mean it doesn't have value. So you have to really look at them. And the Journal of Southern History is one of the top journals out there. You don't hear African-American anywhere in that. Journal of Southern History, and I look back at that one's down here. Not African-American specific, but lots of African-American scholars or people in the African-American history space write for the Journal of Southern History because it's so prestigious. So JSTOR, I said, when I said I don't pay for it, what you can do, you can just plan, you can use it to plan your research. So here, there's something, uh, it was formerly called Register and Read, that, and it's called My JSTOR now. But what you can do, and I just found this out. I thought for sure I saw that they had changed and reversed their policy. But I was on there because I have to be on there because they keep changing stuff, not just JSTOR, but all these places. That's why I have to work so hard with these things because they keep changing stuff. Uh, but my JSTOR, you know, I'm right on here, I have it on here, it allows you up to six articles a month. You got to put them on your shelf and read them. Once, and, and so you can... Uh, I took six hours a month, read on, but you, so you can't download them, but you can read them because they're on your bookshelf. So you can do that. Um, during the pandemic, they expanded that out to 100 because they knew people couldn't, you know, so they, that's great. But I just read on the thing that their COVID policy is still in place. So you can actually put on your bookshelf 100 articles a month to look at. And most people aren't going to get to that many. So it's just way, it's just great. So take advantage of that while it's still in place. Month to month, you know, when they're going to when they're going to change that. But by registering, when you register for my JSTOR, it gives you like a workspace where you can organize your stuff, right? You can make notes and do different things, um, maybe comments about the articles that you found or whatever. But it's a nice, neat work workspace to keep you organized in JSTOR, so you know what you've looked at probably before, right? You don't go back for the same article, um, and it provides a way for you to search material from home. And then save those findings until you have download access. So let me let me explain that again. Because very important. So what I do, and others do, is when we find stuff on JSTOR. Oh my gosh, I want that article, but I can't download it. I just I, I need it. <laughs> I'm a needy person. I have to have it. And so I have. So I just put it in my to do list when I'm going to a university, going to a place that has JSTOR. And then when I'm there, I work my list. Because I can, I got my flash drive and I got plenty of space on it. And so I'm loading it up 
with those articles that I knew I wanted, but I couldn't get them from home. So home was a preparation, finding what I wanted. I go to the library where I can download every single one of those articles in most places without a charge. Okay, the libraries won't charge you for that. That's usually a free uh, one in their space. And so it's wonderful. So that's the strategy. So here's actually, you can learn, when you go to the website, it tells you how to register for a JSTOR account. And uh, this was a neat thing. See, that's why I had to keep going out there. And that's why I'm just dragging and exhausted sometimes because they keep changing things. They're getting better. They're getting better. And so with JSTOR, what I discovered about it six months or so ago, their database, because these databases are getting so smart and intuitive, they know they can identify documents basically by doing a check for the copyright date. And if they know it's copyrighted or it's not out of, it's out of copyright and it's in JSTOR, you get full access right then, right? And so lots of times you're not looking at necessarily at the copyright date or whatever. Oh, that's a great article on Greene County, Alabama or whatever. And you don't, you're not looking exactly at what the date is. And then you realize you're pleasant surprise. You'll say, you can download this whole thing because they can allow you to do it because it's out of copyright. Okay, Ancestor Hunt. Uh, Ancestor Hunt is, um, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna, I should make y'all pay me. <laughs> I'm telling you, they paying me, but I should make y'all pay me on top. No, just, just the next website is just outstanding. It's, it's one of my favorites because newspapers is one of my favorite things. And the guy that runs this, I don't know how he does it. He's amazing. People that have a gift, he has a gift. It's called the Ancestor Hunt. And I've been doing, I wrote a little book on newspapers, black newspapers, how to research black uh, African-American newspapers. And so I know a little about it. And so he, though, and I've been going around and I've been, you know, I mean, you got genealogy fame, um, newspapers.com, there was a newspaper archive that I think is still out there, something called Elephant Hunt. I don't know why they come up that name. I don't know what that name is. Elephant Hunt. But there's just tons of, and so it's like, they're all over the place. And so you're trying to figure out, and they're paid and, and not, you know, free. And you try to try to figure out, I'm, I'm good at it. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where the stuff is when I find a person in, in central Indiana or whatever, you know, if those newspapers, where I can find those newspapers or whatever. It's not really an easy thing. I, I call it information overload. But this is the best site for getting a handle on your newspaper research. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a salvation for me. So here, what you learn here is you learn what's available. You learn from this website if there's even a newspaper from that particular community, right? Uh, right from his website. Um, you know where they're available, like the states and the counties and things, where, the, where you can find them. You know whether they're free, which is important. I remember I'm, I'm my, my wife calls me something, I don't like it. I say, I'm frugal. I'm frugal. Come on. Be honest. I can't believe I've been married for as long as I have. Disparaging me like that. Um, but whether they're free or subscription based uh, is important because, again, I want to spend my, I spend my money, but I, but I do my homework. You know, I got to spend my money here. I need a death record. This is doggone county. Nobody's got it, whatever. I have to go there. And I got to pay the twenty dollars or whatever there. I need to have twenty dollars, not wasted on something else. So free or subscription based. Uh, I have Genealogy Bank, but I don't have most of the other ones. And because uh, this is fairly inexpensive. And how to become? And, and this is what he teaches you. He does lots of videos and teaches you how to become an efficient and effective user of newspaper sites. Because how many of us got time to go there and try to figure out all these sites and how to? Oh, here you do this, and then you use a near, and then you use a far over here. It's, it takes forever to try to figure this stuff out. Well, he does the videos on Genealogy Bank, Chronicling America. It just gives you a little guide, tutor, tutorial on how to do that kind of stuff. So it's, it's great. It saves you a lot of time. So it's created by he is Ken Marks. And think of this as a massive clearinghouse, right? Like a furniture place and all the different furniture from these different places come all in one place. Come on here and buy the furniture that you need versus going to a whole bunch of different places. It's just a massive clear, clearinghouse for online newspaper collections. Okay. And he keeps it. Constantly updated, uh, which is great. He's always out there adding stuff. He's always saying new, new, new. And if you sign up for his like his newsletter, electronic thing, he's telling you when things are new that it came out and what they are. Very organized. I'm not that organized, uh, unfortunately. Uh, and he's developed, I see these valuable tutorials. And so you can't see this. This is a newly designed uh, site. Um, and when we get to the, and I'm going, I say, I'm, I'm purposely, I say, I know I have a lot of slides, but I purposely say, okay, since I know it, uh, as far as what I want to do with you guys in the workshop thing, um, going over 
an hour, but that's it's okay because some of the things I want to do now, I'm actually rethinking them a little bit depending on what you can see and whatever. Uh, that's what teachers do. Like, okay, what's plan B? I got a plan B somewhere. I just got to pull it out of my pocket. And so you really can't see, but we can talk about the, 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 some of this stuff. But here's a warning I can give you that once you get out to the, uh, it's called the ancestor hunt. Once you get out there, Ken finally decided he was going to, uh, he lived in California. That's probably enough said. So expensive to live out there. And so he decided that he had to uh, charge, or, charge or, or get sponsors, not charge. He had to get sponsors that pay. Oh, he got so many people coming up telling everybody, go there. He's got so many people going there that he's got the numbers where he can get paid pretty decent amount from the number of hits or whatever they do. I don't know that space. And so he had, so he had to do it. That's when the website totally changed. And so now it's kind of like you have to be, just be real careful. Be careful what you click on. It's not like you're going to click on something and it's going to, you know, take you to this the Nigerian or something uh, or the Russian. But but you just have to, you, you, you end up tending, just don't click too fast because you will see clearly kind of the thing, but you just be slow the first time going through. And I said, if we, and we may, we may, we may shift some things a little bit. I'll talk to you guys and we'll decide how we're going to do it. But that's something that we would like to walk through so I can kind of show you what the meat parts are so you kind of know what they are. And so, but when you click on them, what I wrote in here, once you do say, okay, here's where the newspaper links are and now I'm in the newspaper links, bookmark it. Everybody knows the bookmark it. So then you don't have to navigate that stuff anymore for that. Bookmark, in, if Indiana's a state you're interested in, and Missouri's a state you're interested in, bookmark those places in this website. Because it'll then avoid you can avoid the aggravation trying to figure that out. You're gonna get used to it eventually, but that's just I don't like any aggravation. So that's just the way I do it. I bookmark that stuff. So yeah, so we'll we'll take actually I put at the last the last workshop is when we're gonna try to look at this. So so that's good because the sun is going down or whatever it's doing. So maybe we'll get a little bit better. Look, so I think this is the last thing we're gonna talk about here. Then I'll start taking questions and we'll move forward. Um, this is something I stumbled across probably in the last couple years maybe or so probably less than a year i started paying for it about a, i think this is the second year of paying for it now i just paid for it again this i paid for no. but <laughs> I, hey drill you know it's good though. i want to hear about this site you paying money i had to pay for this one i had to pay for this one. Um, but you don't have to pay. And that's what we're going we're gonna to say. Like, why did Tim pay this? But I, let me say, let me tell you why I paid. Um, but this is called Legacy Family Tree Webinar. Legacy Family Tree Webinars. And this guy, Geoff, I, I knew him. I, I didn't know him very well. But he came up with a great product, a great business. And it's his legacy. So it's all these genealogy webinars. So he goes out to all these genealogists and say, record your webinar, you know, pays them. To do do talks, do genealogy talks or whatever. So he pays them to do all these things, and all the people to do talks and stuff. And then he offers them to his, he offers them to the general public for a set period of time. But if you're a member, you have access to them two months later or whatever, right? There's a short window for people who aren't members. And if you're not a member, if they give you a syllabus with all the information on it, handout, you don't get that either. You have to be a member. And so he's, he's got it really set up nice. But you, but the thing is, you can you can see these uh, people talk, and most of the majority of them, again, they're, they're experts. They're the people you're going to see in some of these other spaces. They're very, very good at what they do. And so this is just, again, this is just a list of all the different, some of the different, he organized them by topics and things. So like, if you really want, I want to learn more about technology and genealogy, you can click on the technology thing, it gives you all the ones that they gave that was technology beginners, DNA testing, if that's your thing now. Uh, and so there's different stuff. He, he did it. And so I'm sure African American is going to be in there too. And so you can go and do this. But when you sign up, or you don't have to sign up, you can just go out there on a regular basis and see what they're doing, you know, this week, what which ones are coming up. Because again, a seven-day window. You register, even if you miss it, you register. So you still, you know, anyway, you still come back, it'll be on their website for seven days. So if something came up, change the plans, you can still do it. Um, it's a legacy family tree webinars. Legacy family tree webinars. And I mentioned this thing called Percy, and a lot of you didn't know what Percy was. 
You got to know what Percy is. It's fantastic. P-E-R-S-I. And so it's, it's, a, it's the baby of Allen County a Public Library and, and came on, I think it was online before Kirk Witcher was even there. Um, but they, they, long story short, they went, it went out. They kind of sent it another, they let somebody else have it to use it. I paid them for it, whatever. Uh, and now that relationship uh, uh, is over or whatever. So they have it back at Allen County Library. So it's new and it's different, but they bought it back and they're integrating it in a different way. Uh, but basically, it's a periodical source index. And like I said, so many of different um, uh, genealogy newsletters, some historical journals and things like that, but historical and genealogical societies, they just sign up for their... So at my my, my uh, uh, society in Chicago, they have a newsletter and Allen County pays the subscription and then they they have it in their collection. And then they, they they go through and they filter, okay, they're talking about Mississippi, they're talking about Tubalo, Mississippi, or whatever. So they create an index. And so you can go and you know what's in it. So they, they do that work for you. And so, but Sonny Morton, who's excellent, the person called Sonny Morton, uh, she's doing a talk in March, late March, on Percy 2.0, the new Percy for everyone. So I've got two things I'm going to be looking at in the next month or so. And one of them is this particular one. Because again, it's something I need to learn about the new Percy now. I just remember the old Percy. Uh, and this is great. This is something, again, you probably can put legacy family tree. And when you get into legacy family tree, you can put uh, uh, African diaspora theory. Anybody want me to spell diaspora? Yes. D-I-A-S-P-O-R-A. Af African diaspora series. And what they've done in the last couple of years, which is really cool, is they created this series. Uh, I think it's the first Friday of each month. They've got these uh, speakers. Most of them, when I look at this list, I know them all, except for I think two people. And they do uh, they do a talk. And it's, it's like basically an African-American track, African-American series. So you can go out there now and look and see what their talks are and schedule it first Friday. Or if you don't see it on first Friday, what do you do? You want to catch it before seven days go by. And then you can't see it anymore if you haven't paid. The price is $50. And let me let me say, I think it's now. But it's $49.95. It's $50. Uh, but what what I did, they had they had a special the first time when I got it, they hooked me. It was uh half price. So it was $25. And I was like, how do you get it for $25? And then after I got I fell in love. You know when you fall in love? It was all over after that. So anyway, speaking of all over, that's this presentation. So uh, uh, thanks for not falling asleep. <laughs> but anyway, uh, question. If you have any, so, I see some people ask questions during the day. Some people have questions now, maybe marinating there. We're mulling and pondering as my good friend Mark Lothar. So any questions you have about any topic, I need to go back and Talk about a little more. That I cannot answer. I don't know, maybe the librarians might, they've been to some of these places if they could live chat. I would bet that Legacy Family Tree does because they're really like a business. Uh, and I would think that, I don't know about Allen County. Probably not, but they, I mean, they're, they're, they have an ask a library. Ask a librarian, um, and they just get back to you pretty quick. Some of the some of the websites like FamilySearch.org, there are forums. There are forums on like Ancestry.com. Uh, I don't think there are forums for the library edition, but if you get a subscription to Ancestry, um, but yeah, some of them do. Do you guys have uh, the library here? Do you have most of those like? Are you talking about like JSTOR or anything like that? I not JSTOR. Uh, it's JSTOR is a lot more common with academic libraries. Um, and I actually had a, a few questions on chat. Is that all right if I if I ask you? Oh, um, let's get that. Oh, okay. Sorry. My just question was going to be how user friendly are most of these sites for a, a beginner novel. I would say that they're not difficult. As a teacher, I would be very pleased if I had to teach about teaching genealogy class to high schoolers. I would feel comfortable teaching. I think I think they're very. And here's the great thing about it: 
is that we just talk about all these different legacy family tree, whatever. You can teach yourself by listening to somebody that knows it very, very well. So you can have an instructor basically in the room with you telling you what to do or the different nuances of the website. And by the time you get done with that, you're ready to rock and roll. So just I would listen to a webinar. You're going to find one somewhere of all the stuff I talked about before you tackle um, any particular site. That's my recommendation. Okay. Does anybody else have questions? How does the site, it sounds like the family search dot for the land say that might be the only one you can surely like to get from home on any so, I mean, what sites could you actually Google from home and uh, get okay, to that's a good question. access? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I'm gonna I'm gonna go to where I can see all my slides real quick. Um, legacy. So all those free webinars yeah. within the seven day period. That's free. Um, if you guys can think of any of the other ones, uh, I see in slideshow. Uh, I think a fair amount of them are. I don't think too many of them are actually cost and cost to. Let's see. Um, yeah, the only cost for a fair amount of them, and, and, and Matthew really nailed it, is uh, you just have to uh, go where you have university library access. And I, I can look across the room and say, don't tell me you can't, you know, that you don't have something that's fairly close to you, you know, IUPUI or, or whatever. I mean, there's just too many uh, Butler, something with, and, and again, if it's an hour drive, it should be worth it to you if you're serious about your genealogy. And again, you plan ahead and take some of those things. But I, I think that uh, uh, some of these things with JSTOR, again, it's free. But then the other piece of it is if you want really, you really want the article. Because here's the thing, again, when you get an article from JSTOR, when I get an article from JSTOR and download it, almost everything that gets downloaded, right, is OCR, right? It's, it's, it's being read word for word. So if I'm looking for a certain thing in these articles or whatever, I can go control F or do whatever, and then I can look and search that whole article. That's why I want the whole thing. You know, it's 46 pages or whatever, you know, but I'm looking for certain things. So I got certain keywords I'm looking for. So that's the advantage. So that's why I'd want to go to a university library. It's worth it to me in that particular instance. But, but most of these things that I talked about, interlibrary loan, um, the books that you can get there, I, I, I did the, the book and I said, this is something that, and again, I really love what I do. Um, and because I learned new things and I'm sharing stuff to you that probably a lot of people don't know because it's just a, that learning process over the course of 40 years or whatever. Um, but my library, when I say the libraries are so different, again, I think I probably did my best happy dance in four or five years when this happened. The library in Wilmington, University of North Carolina in Wilmington, for some reason, they decided that they were going to take their, again, they were making space. It's the kids, but I thank the kids for doing this. The <laughs> yeah. in the space. There was a, are they taken, and they didn't tell it to me. I came in here and said, pounding my pistol. Mm -hmm. where's, the, where's the reference books? You know, because I'm always looking at reference because I can't take them out of the library. Come to find the reference books, they made general collection books. So they took all of those reference books that were sitting in a certain space, freed up that space, and inserted them into their general collection, which makes them now, with my library card, where I can get four books out of there because I'm a resident, I now can get this book. <laughs> I talked about the Dictionary of Afro American Slavery. If I didn't have it, I could get it and take it home. Oh my gosh. So library book, I see encyclopedia, we're talking about encyclopedias, those types of things. The, the really, really, really good stuff is usually because it's good stuff because they pay a lot more money for it and they keep in that reference area, you can't check it out. But now Tim can say, I'm in a bubble where I can check it out in UNCW, you know, anytime I want. This six miles from my house or whatever. So those kinds of things are, look for those nuances. Again, check out all the libraries around here. Oh, so-and-so's closest to me or whatever. Go another three or four miles one day and, and see what they got going on in that library. Okay, so if what I'm hearing is correct. The key is to initially um, get your library card and then become a friend of the library. And then maybe even be, 
get a um, college library card or university, wherever, and then that opens up opens you up to a lot more um, information that you might need. But once you get that information, you can basically plug into what you need. I mean, I know that you could, you'd have to go to different places if, if they don't have the JSTOR or something like that. But you could um, that that's probably your first step is to to plug into your library. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I wanted to mention really quick the uh, there's a couple of resources on here also that were totally free um, that he mentioned. Internet Archive is a really really good one um, because Internet Archive has tons and tons of of old old books that are public domain and um world cat's another one that's 100 percent free and and uh, world cat's amazing because it pretty much gives you access to all library collections university public that has archival collections kind of you name it world cat um yep no and they're both outstanding and so to piggyback on that and the importance as a teacher, again, I say, I tell my students, hey, whatever you do with the information, you do with it, but I don't feel my obligation. When you, with WorldCat, for example, it, it, it's so, and every, every month it gets better. I'm like, it can't get better than this, but it gets better. Internet Archive, same thing. I don't think this can get better, but some of the things, I, I just scratched the surface about Internet Archive, and that's what Matt was trying to say. There's a whole lot there, and they keep evolving and getting better and better, sort of blow you away. But how do you know about that? It's by going to uh, family, going to Roots, Roots Tech, which is free, and taking a you know, finding a class on Internet Archive or whatever, and find out you know the newest changes in Internet Archive or whatever. In WorldCat, yeah, WorldCat's the kind of site where you can create your, like I say, MySpace with JSON. You can kind of create your own space where you know what what books, what searches you made, what you might forget, but keep a log of all the different stuff, whatever. They've got a space that keeps you organized there. Where you can, I think you can plug in to other people and see you can create book lists. So all these books that you might hear me saying about, oh, these are good. You can create book lists and then other share it and other people that have that common whatever, right? You start making connection with people that know. So you're making friends with people where your common thing is the books that African American genealogists seek, that type of stuff. So those little nuances that we can't squeeze into, you know, 75 minutes or whatever are those nice little nuances. One thing I want to correct you on. A little is is is, is uh, you are absolutely right, but the friends of the library again, it's a gateway. It's a way to get. It's all about getting the most access you can, right? And so the friends of the library is not a prerequisite. Once you get the library card here, is whatever you can get. But again, just real quick, one of the things I was able to do, I I couldn't wait to get away from that snow, but but I was really hesitating because I live. 30 miles or whatever from Northern Illinois University. And it's just, who knows who Northern Illinois University, but that they were a researcher's dream for African-Americans. And what it was, was that for some reason, the scholars that were there, the African-American scholars that came in the time, the early time in the 60s when the first program first got started and whatever, they were getting unlimited access to ask for different resources. So their book collection is for African-Americans, outstanding. Then they have this really unbelievable collection of African-American newspapers. And I haven't seen it duplicate almost any other place. You have to go to Princeton, maybe, or some other place. It's at Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, you know, up the road from me. And so when I, and then when I discovered there, because I became a friend, that's, that's one of the places I'm a friend in the library, you know, where Tim, money. Tim spends $50 a year to be a friend of the library well, when I was there because that increased the number of books I could check out from like four to like 24. Uh, and it gave me the ability because they did every, every place is not gonna do it. They gave me the ability. And that was a big, one of the biggest things for me. It gave me the ability to find books. We're talking about going out there, the interlibrary loan, the ILL. Because I was at a university library versus that little village of North Aurora library that they might get, they don't have to take your interlibrary loan request. They don't have to. And these big prestigious universities that have this rich African-American stuff, they're not going to send that stuff to everybody because it's not just books, it's other things and too. So these things you really kind of want that they, they might hesitate on. When, when they saw me, they saw Northern Illinois University. 
So I never got denied, but that $50 gave me the ability as a non-resident to order stuff through their interlibrary loan. And that's very unique. When you find something like that, you you get you you send me a video, you're doing a happy dance because that's huge. <laughs> because they'll do university to go university library to university library. And the reason they'll do that versus the public library, small library, the, the odds of the public libraries don't ask them for all them. They don't really, I'm, I'm trying to be funny. It's, it's just a fact. They don't care that much. They deal with the Scotland, the Ivy Tower. They 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 little 40 30, right? And so, but they want their scholars to be able to get stuff from, they don't know what Northern might have or these other universities might have. Unique, they understand that, unique collections and stuff. So they wouldn't, in most cases, they will not deny a request from a brother or sister university library. That's the big thing about getting access at a university. Um, I just have a couple of questions from Jane in our, uh, our virtual uh, meeting. Um, she has some questions about JSTOR. Um, she, I, one of them I'm pretty sure I could answer, but um, she asked, are many older issues OER? I think, is that open educational resource? Um, I, can, I can ask her a, a clarifying question. And then she wanted to know whether her library must have a subscription. And I'm, I mean, it, JSTOR is a subscription-based service. I mean, there, I'm, I think there are some public libraries that have JSTOR, but most don't. One with bigger, but big yeah, budgets. Big budgets, yeah. I, I would check Indianapolis. I mean, wherever she is, I check at lar the largest library close to her. Chicago Public Library has it. Boston Public Library has it. ACPL probably has it, don't they? Yep. Okay, because she's from Auburn. Um, yep. Yeah, Allen County would have it. Okay. So I'm going to convince you all to stay, huh? <laughs> <laughs> And you'll skip out on me. Like, like the person that's like going to sit in the back in the back row or whatever, say, oh, this stuff ain't good, man. I, I, the exercise is only about 10, 10, 10 yards away. So that's that's the only question that I have right now. Um, I think you answered the question earlier about uh, there's some people that had asked about the slideshow. So you'll do kind of like an abbreviated uh, slideshow that you'll send out to us that people can look at. Yeah, and I, they can hear me or whatever I guess they can or whatever, and you uh -huh. can reinforce it in the chat or whatever. Yeah. If you have a special request, but only five dollars. No. <laughs> if you have a special request on a certain slide that you saw, say, oh, I want this slide. Again, you can email me because it may not get in that packet or whatever. And if it's something that you said that tickled your fancy, they can ask for that slide. I can't imagine any slide that I created uh, for this program through three presentations that I'll say can't get that one. Anything that I have, you can you can get. So if they have a special request for a certain one, just tell me uh, what it is. Okay. And, and if they're not real sure, again, I'm a friendly. I'm a busy guy, but I'm a friendly guy too. And if they say I don't know exactly sure it was in this section or whatever, you know, I'll find some time in my schedule to. You know, uh, maybe have a Zoom with them or whatever, or with you, and we'll quickly go through the slides so that you can kind of they can see whatever it is or whatever. Because again, all the stuff is fast and whatever, and I understand that. So that wouldn't be a problem either to try to assist you in finding whatever slide it was that you want because it went by a little too fast for it. Well, do we want to have like a, a short break? Yeah, I think. I think. Yeah. We'll have like a, a okay. Do you have a website that we can access your slide I information? A terrible website. Girl, don't I mean, remind me of that now. <laughs> don't if somebody said they Googled me already, they saw that pitiful thing. That was Tim Bidding like about 20 years ago. No, I, I've actually got money now, like that book. I got money sitting and I'm trying to come up launch a really a new website. Uh and, and but I gotta admit, besides how busy I said was. I've been trying to launch that website for a while now. And so uh, it's, it's, it's like that baby that just won't go, man, that's not good. He had it coming out. <laughs> and so, but anyway, 
the best thing you can do, honestly, is you're going to get information from me if you sign up for the newsletter. It only comes out once a month or whatever. But that's the best way kind of to, to other than I, I give you my email, too. But that's that's a way where you get some stuff from me. That's the way you can like, to interact. But more stuff is coming online and I'm actually paying somebody to the website. It's almost really about 90 percent done. Oh, okay. So maybe 2023 will be the year. And then I have to tell you all my wife paid me because she's like, well, I don't think that's ever going to be done. She's been talking about it forever. So I'll tell you. There's a headline that'll say, Wife painted. <laughs> <laughs> wife painted. 